You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we are in Logroño. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney. I'm back on the Vuelta a España in place of Richard Moore, who's gone home. Uh, his Vuelta is over. He's not going to make it to Madrid. I'm not going to make it to Madrid either. I'm bailing out at the top of the Angleru on Saturday. Um, but I'm Great up that you're not making up the Angleru. Oh, you are making up the Angleru. Oh, right. yeah, I'm going to make it up the Angleru, Daniel. Um, I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, Daniel. Good hello, to see you. Hello, hello, Taps. You well? Yeah, I'm, yeah, strong, strong, strong. Always come good in the final week, don't yeah, you, Daniel? Yeah, we've got to keep pace with these young bucks that we have on the podcast now, Fran Reyes. Indeed. He's taking the average age down. I already take the average age down on the podcast significantly, but Fran breaks it down even more significantly. I'm not sure you understand averages there, Daniel. Is that Seven today? years? Uh, Eight years? Nine years? Anyway. Get out of town. Well, I am. Hang on. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, and Fran Reyes. Good to see you, Fran. Mm. Good to see you back. Where, I know. where are we, Fran? Well, we are in Logroño, great capital city of La Rioja, the region of wine here in Spain. But, Fran, it's not really surrounded by Rioja Viñas, is it? I mean, it's kind of, it's the start of Rioja country. Yeah, we could, we could say that. I mean, it's uh, the deepest part of La Rioja, where the Rioja wine is actually produced. Also, in the nearby province of Vitoria, And there are some Rioja wine trees. Wine trees, vine <laughs> trees. Yeah, <laughs> with a lot of bottles. I can I can confirm Fran hasn't been on the Rioja. I had a, <laughs> I had quite a few glasses of Rioja last night, I'm a little sure tasting did, session. We found a lovely street in Logroño here, which was all tapas bars. It was absolutely fantastic out till reasonably late because it was a rest day. And um, some of the Rioja was, was really very nice. And the one the barman told us was flavored with whiskey because the the oak barrels uh, previously are used to store whiskey and then cleaned out and then the wine goes in there and it takes on a slight whiskey edge i don't know whether he's having me on there does that sound plausible daniel It's plausible i'm not sure i approve but anyway <laughs> well anyway should we talk about the vuelta a España, which resumed today with stage 16 it was a time trial it went from the motor racing circuit at nevada uh, here to lagroño 40 kilometers and chris Froome has strengthened his grip on the red jersey by winning the stage an impressive performance he now leads overall by 158 from vincenzo nibali the other ride of the day was wilco kelderman i think of team sunweb finished second on the stage 29 seconds down on Froome. uh continuing team sunweb Sunweb's fantastic season of Grand Tours. Tom de Moulin, of course, won the Giro. Then they had both jerseys at the Tour de France with Michael Matthews winning the green jersey, Warren Barguil winning the King of the Mountains. And now Kelderman looks pretty well set to finish on the podium, although he will have his work cut out perhaps against uh, Ilnur Zakarin, who's 27 seconds behind him. And who knows, maybe even Miguel Angel Lopez or Alberto Contador in the final mountain stages will gain enough time to make a late run at the podium. Bad performances today, or, or probably par performances, but big time loss uh, for the likes of Michael Woods, 3 minutes 40, Louis Menkes, 3.42, Esteban Chavez, 4 minutes and 1 second. Um, so really, Chris Froome was talking yesterday in his press conference Um, about hoping to extend his lead. And he's done that quite significantly, hasn't he, Daniel? He has, and a, a commanding time trial win for Froome. He, he hasn't been prolific in time trials recently. In fact, the last one he won was at the Vuelta last year. But in the very top company against the very best opponents, he hasn't been quite the rider in time trials that he was maybe two or three years ago. But today, certainly very commanding. Interesting, the strategy that he adopted, he went out quite slowly, relatively slowly, and, and sort of literally almost went through the gears as the time trial went on and gain time was gaining a lot of time in the final section um it's been a hallmark of this as well as a performance by Froome this kind of calculating nature we spoke to him yesterday we heard from him yesterday about how he thought it would be a mistake to go really really deep today or go way beyond his limit or anyone else who 
past his limit um, at, at the risk of compromising their performance tomorrow at Los Machucos. And I think Froome is just, he's a real sort of master now of calculating his effort, measuring his effort. And, you know, this is a phase that I think all of the great, all the very good Grand Tour riders eventually progress to where they, you know, they know exactly how their body's going to react to every challenge, every situation. And, um, you know, they don't feel the need for any big kind of huge attacks anymore or to even follow their instincts at times they really know how to dose every droplet of energy well we were at Chris Froome's rest day press conference at his hotel um, on the other side of town here so let's hear a little bit about what Chris Froome said obviously this was from before the time trial but it's quite interesting in light of what you've just said to hear Chris Froome's thoughts yesterday I mean obviously we've got Angliru on on Saturday which is going to be a massive way to to finish off the the GC battle of this year's Vuelta we've also got uh, Los Machucos which is the day after tomorrow after the time trial and that's going to be one I mean not as long as Angliru but certainly the gradients are are right up there I mean I think pitches of over 20% those are going to be two very critical stages and I think in a way, tomorrow's time trial, whoever leaves absolutely everything on the road will pay for it on, on Los Machucos the day after. So it's a really tough final week and I think every day has got to be ridden thinking about what's coming up as well. And the memories from 2011, I mean, it just uh, that was the day that I basically got the all clear from the team to, to go for it. Um, Brad Brad was fading on the slopes of uh, Angliru and I, I still felt good and basically got the green light there to, to push on and, and, and go for it. So, I mean, quite cool memories from back then, but it's, it's a grueling climb. Uh, I, I hope I have the same legs that I had back in 2011. I would say Zonkolan in uh, the Giro is the toughest climb I've ever ridden, but Angliru is definitely up there. Probably the next next toughest. Chris, in terms of the way you planned your season with the Tour first and the World second, obviously nobody's done this job this way around before. Yeah. And do you feel that you've got it right in terms of having enough left for the last week, or is it still a kind of bit of a journey into the unknown? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 always every year. It's it's a bit of an unknown. Uh, having done the Tour first, um, but I do believe after I don't know how many years we've tried now, four or five years to try and get this right. We've We've got a lot, a lot closer this year, and certainly we've come here with a lot more purpose. And I think, I think we're seeing that now. I mean, I, I haven't been in the leaders' jersey of the Vuelta since, since 2011. So um, I think we, we definitely got something right this year. But certainly not gonna, not gonna bank on anything just yet. There's a lot of, a lot of big racing to come before, before we reach Madrid. Well, Chris Froome there talking about the danger that lurks in Wednesday's stage with another very steep finish. It's on a kind of concrete road, isn't it? I'm not familiar with it. What do you know about it, Fran? Anything? Well, it's crazy steep, um, basically a gold path. Like a lot of uphill finishes here in the Vuelta. It's interesting, Chris Froome made that point, as you said, Daniel, um, that anyone who goes deep today might pay for it tomorrow. It seems to me a, a, that was a bit of a game of bluff. He was getting that out there last night, maybe making people think twice about how they would um, tackle the time trial today. And as it turns out, he's gained more time. And I was thinking about this yesterday, the way he's approached these two Grand Tours. Of course, this double's never been done before with the Tour followed by the Vuelta. He looks on course to do that now. But I was thinking if the Tour and the Vuelta were both games of monopoly, he won the Tour de France by buying the stations and the utilities and just, you know, securing his victory that way. In the first two weeks of this Vuelta, he's really gone big. He's built hotels on Mayfair and Park Lane. And now in the final week of this Vuelta, I think he's just going to collect the rent. I think it was Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the drawing room. <laughs> a completely different board game. Fran, do you have the game Monopoly in Spain? Of course we do. And we, we even have a fake subpar version called Superpoli. Superpoli, and it's based in Madrid, I, I assume. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Based, based in Madrid. Um, yeah. Oh, it's like the Monopoly, but quite cheaper and the uh, quality is way lower. But my point is that, you know, he plotted his way around the tour very thoughtfully. You know, he's turned the screw early in this race and now he's in such a commanding position. He doesn't need to do very much in the final week, does he? He just needs to be careful, mark, and uh, make sure nothing 
particularly untowards happened and he's helped a lot I think by the fact that Miguel Angel Lopez has not done a great time trial today so even if he does go crazy tomorrow and on the Angler on Saturday not going to pose any great threat is he? No I don't think so I mean, you said Lopez, where you, you're very diplomatic, Lionel, in describing a couple of the riders' time trials. I used to have a French teacher, Mr. Mather, who, were, who if anyone slipped below 10 out of 20, the only comment on their work would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like I was reminded of, some, of Mr. Mather's marking technique today when I saw some of the results for the time trial. That's really the only comment that... Oh, Lopez has done okay no, there. Two thirty-four. He's probably he pretty good, the least, actually. least pretty good, bad pretty of good. the bad um, results today. Yeah. But guys, I drove the course out behind two Manzano Postabon riders, and um, it was really interesting to actually ride the course. And what Chris Froome said about the the gradually increasing steps in the first half, rising up, and then the gradually decreasing steps in the second half made it quite a test of sort of judgment. It might have been tempting to go out too hard in that first bit, and then pay for it on the uh, downhill and flatter sections towards the end but it was an interesting course to go and see and we got overtaken by Bob Youngles of Quick Step at one point he was one of the guys who might have thought about possibly winning the stage but had uh, a disappointing result finished ninth on the stage got a 20 second time penalty haven't managed to find out what that was for but I imagine it was because he got stuck in so much traffic he may well have sat behind a car or a bike or one of the Manzano Postabon riders for a bit too long perhaps find out tomorrow I guess it was an amazingly rolling course when you looked at the profile in the road book it looked like a completely flat course and then um, well there was actually very little flat road it, they weren't steep climbs they weren't steep descents but uh, I spoke to Vincenzo Nibli at the finish and my old chum Vincenzo were getting on like a house on fire now <laughs> yeah. I think I think in fact well, can I even say I know yet? that someone had a word um, really? <laughs> anyway he talks about the fact that you know for a light rider he's a relatively light rider he weighs 60 something kilos um, you know, well, the wind was whipping across the road and he was sort of being thrown around all over the shop and you had to keep the pace very very high to sort of prevent yourself almost derailing and you know at times he was going at 60 kilometers an hour at 70 kilometers an hour but it was that kind of course there were some incredibly straight roads as well there were, there were times when you could see f- four or five kilometers um, ahead of yourself Fran, Alberto Contador, when he crossed the line here in La Grogna, he set the fastest time. Yeah. Um, it was never going to be enough to win the stage, but a decent performance, or was that disappointing, do you think? No, no, no. I mean, I, for one, haven't found any great disappointment or surprise in today's performances. I guess the circumstance of the wind that was tailwind for the most of the course, or if not tailwind, at least favorable for the riders, did make for some, let's say, predictable results. And uh, yeah, Contador was actually a bit higher, a bit better than I expected. But yeah, that technical draw he did, had with uh, Zakarin and Nibali, three of them in two seconds time, was pretty good performance for him, you know. And after the finish, the press and the fans were euphoric, you know, like the... 100th resurrection of Alberto Contador for victory and uh, one of the journals there asked Contador three times whether he was going to race for the podium from now on but he was uh, reluctant to assert that was it our friend from Cadena Cope uh, nope Onda Cero Cadena Ser Onda Cero ah yeah yeah the uh, tiny Fran, talk to us about the Spanish radio journalists. What an, what an awesome bunch they are. There are three of them. Onda, is it Onda Cero? Onda yeah. Cero. Onda Cero, Cadena Cero. Cadena Cero. And they Cadena hunt, they hunt, they hunt yeah. in packs, but they are the most aggressive journalists I've ever seen. If there was a, a media scrum world championships, they would be my hot favorites for, for positions one, two, and three. Yeah, we, we have always been a country of fighters, you know, and uh, they, they clearly inherited this. As I see, they fight to have what everyone else is having. They want to have Contador words because they see a bunch of people going to get Contador. If this bunch follows De La Cruz, they go after De La Cruz. But, you know, it, it's effectively, it's like a wolf pack chasing fresh meat, you know. And in this case, the meat that is best served is always Alberto Contador because right. Jacinto Vidarte... Let's not talk about meat and contador, please. <laughs> Let's not. Don't <laughs> encourage people. Clean <laughs> police. Just uh, before we move on from contador, I mean, 
he's got four days really hasn't he and uh, really only two opportunities to to win a stage and go out on a on a real high you know what are people expecting from him in these last few days fireworks just that you know fireworks attacks from attacking from far away and maybe getting the victory in the angry room that would be the fairy tale ending you know rather than winning the world uh, it would be winning the angry room which is considered the most legendary mountain top in Spain right now, despite the fact that it has only been holding races for, what, 20 years maybe, from 1999, if I am not mistaken. So, yeah, that would be the fairy tale ending, but it's quite difficult to see an scenario on which Alberto Contador can actually win there. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast, enabling us to be here in wonderful Lagronio. It's not as warm as I was expecting. It's still fairly warm. It's not as warm as it was down in the south when I left the race. Um, but I've been watching at home on TV, and although he's not a new name in terms of uh, impressive results, the, the man of the middle week was Miguel Angel Lopez of Astana. Two stage wins, Fran. What did you make of his time trial, and, and what can you tell us about him? Well, you know, the, the other day I was speaking to his personal masseur, some to Vicente Velda, Vicente, who told me that Miguel Angel is actually doing great this week because of two factors. First was freshness, and second was that the kind of efforts, the type of efforts that were held in the second week were exactly perfect to match his skills. He is great to do long efforts on steady courses, such as these climbs to Calar Alto or... Um, Sierra Nevada. Uh, or Sierra Nevada, where... And because of that, he told me that probably the time trial was the stage that suited him best out of the last week. Now, Los Machucos and Angliru are too explosive of climbs to actually suit him. There's this misconception about Colombian riders and Colombian climbers, isn't there? And I think we've talked about this with regard to uh, Nairo Quintana before, that I remember at the start of his career, you know, people would look at, for example, the Vuelta route and they would see these really steep climbs and they would think, ah, you know, it's perfect for a little guy, a mountain goat like Quintana. But actually, uh, and this was something I spoke to Esteban Chavez about the other day, um, that most of the climbs in Colombia are relatively steady, r incredibly long, and on wide roads. Um, they look a lot like the climbs you kind of see in the Tour of Utah or Colorado Challenge. Um, and then, you know, they're nothing like the climbs we see in the Vuelta. And, and that's reflected by the results of some of the Colombian riders here and, you know, in other races, that some of them, Lopez is one, Quintana is another, they do like the long climbs. He's certainly been the most impressive Astana rider, though, hasn't he? I mean, Fabio Aru is a former winner of the Vuelta, He's been a, a real disappointment here, hasn't he? A, a disappointment, but I, I always like to see a rider who, who is not in the best form and for whom things are not going particularly well, at least like cling on and continue to ride for general classification. I always feel it's a bit of a cop-out for someone like Fabio Aru to you know, lose 30 minutes on general classification and then go for a stage win. And um, you, you know, Roman Bardet's ridden a, an unusual Vuelta in that respect. He's... Well, he lost time early and then he has tried to win stages. It's not worth him. But I actually think it shows more kind of character and it's more important for someone's career progression to do what Arrow has done and sort of battle through some level of adversity or at least, you know, struggle through indifferent form to, you know, still be seventh on general classification. What do you make, by the way, about the performance of Steven Kreisbike? Because I pretty much expected him to be on the top seven of this race and he's quite far away from it. I must confess, um, having not been here for a week, I was fairly unaware that he was even in the race, well, to be one of those ones? <laughs> one of those ones. I was thinking, well, well. as you said, Stephen Kreiswick there, I was thinking, uh, well, he's not riding, is he? But no, he is riding. Um, did see him today, actually, at the, at the start. Yeah, I, I mean, talk about being overshadowed by his fellow countrymen um, this season. You know, last year, after going so close in the Giro, you know, he, he looked like a real a possible for the, for the podium in a Grand Tour and now of course Tom de Moulin and here Wilco Kelderman are completely outshining him and uh, I mean it's difficult to say you know what's up with him but 
clearly it's not going to plan for him. And, and that team uh, are really struggling to pick out anything else, aren't they? AG2R. Yes, Daniel. Well, they started two men light today, didn't they? Because on the rest day, some footage emerged on social media. You might be able to shed some light on how this happened, Daniel. But uh, yeah, Alexandra Geniez and Nico Dens of AG2R have been pulled out of the race by their team because they were filmed holding onto the team car. Was it on Sierra Nevada on Sunday? Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and so out of the race. And their team car, not the direct sportive who was guilty, but the team, the second team car is out of the race. So AG2R have only got one team car for the remainder of the race. Who was the sports director? The sports in the director car? was Didier Janel, and he's still on the race. Um, he's going to be doing various other odd jobs but he's not allowed well he, he I presume he won't be in the first team car because that's Julien Jordi the, the first director but yeah they've lost their car so you know if, if uh, an AG2R rider gets in a break these last few days they haven't got too many riders left I think they've got four or five left and Pots of Eva is out and the two riders who have been kicked out are obviously not here anymore um, but yeah if a rider gets in a break then they'll have a decision to make I guess it's at their discretion whether they send a team car forward and leave well the the, their captain Bardet in the peloton unattended unassisted or whether they don't they simply don't follow the break and the same applies at the back of the race um, you know the, the, I'm sure some of the riders will be getting drops on some of these high mountains and they won't be able to assist them this uh, is not without precedent is it riders being kicked out of races for holding onto cars for too long you mentioned Roman Bardet he was kicked out of Paris Nice wasn't he um, for doing that Vincenzo Nibali of course in the Vuelta a few years ago um, I mean that was a famous example because he yeah, that was a real turbocharged you know he's holding onto the car as it was accelerating past other riders or at least accelerating across a gap this is really quite different in that the riders were obviously in or off the back of the Gruppetto um, struggling in to make it to the finish line on a, on a really difficult summit finish. And the footage has emerged on social media, basically on a, a Twitter stream. And the team has taken the uh, action to withdraw the riders from the race on the basis that it doesn't project the, the right image for the team, rather than being kicked out of the race by commissaires. Because the commissaires, of course, can only act upon what they see with their own eyes or what they are told by people working within the race. I mean, it's a real dangerous precedent if we get to a stage where the footage shot on the side of the road is used to actually enforce the rules. That isn't what has happened here, but it's a, a, in a slightly grey area, isn't it? Not saying that the two AG2R riders shouldn't have been withdrawn from the race because you're not allowed to hold on to a team car. But then again, there is an element of who's refereeing, you know, who's in charge of deciding what's fair play and what isn't fair play. And I always feel a bit iffy about this kind of thing. I've mentioned this on the podcast before about the golf tournament where it was a, a, one of the women's majors where the ball moved and the player didn't notify the official sign for the wrong score. Somebody watching at home on TV uh, then phoned up the tournament and basically got a two or three stroke penalty. Well, ha it happens a lot in golf. And, yeah, and I, I kind of think... I've, have people not got better to do than or I mean no, well, I in, this, in this instance um, the footage obviously came from another team we don't know which team it was at the moment um, I've got some ideas but I, I'm not sure which team it came from and it was leaked um, and it appeared on social media and then that started a, a series of events which has led to these two riders being checked out. Just on the circumstances themselves, Didier Janel said to me um, this morning that what happened was that he hadn't seen the two riders, so Alexandre Geniez and Nico Dance for a while. There were groups all over the road. So this was the first time he'd seen them for a few kilometres and they needed a drink. I think it was Geniez initially held on to the car, as a lot of riders do, um, just to ask for a drink and um, asked for information about how, well, what the time limit was likely to be and so forth and so forth. Um, Didier Janel says that he couldn't see, he had no awareness of the second rider, almost hidden behind the first rider, um, holding on to the roof rack, really, wasn't he? Um, and, and then the first rider, who, uh, as I say, I think it was Geniers, then started asking for a drink. And as the way that Janelle put it to me was that he was really um, it's, uh, spending really, a lot... Really thirsty. Well, he, he, was, he was asking for a lot of information. Or he was, he was um, basically 
beating about the bush as regards what he was going to drink, you know, when it was going to be delivered, and all sorts of things. I don't know whether he was asking for the ingredients in uh, in whatever sports <laughs> so he drink was making, it was. Playing for time. He really. was playing for time. Yeah. This is this is what Didier Janelle said, and eventually, after a few seconds, I mean, on the clip we see about 20 seconds, I think, of him holding onto the car. Janelle says to him, "Look." you've got to let go now um, at which point you know he was still asking whether the, the lemon juice in the drink was freshly squeezed <laughs> and whether it came from like you know, kind of gene they yeah, were Andalusian gene. citrus groves but yeah so that that is supposedly what happened and the two riders themselves were distraught I understand last night they were both in tears when they were told that they were going to be kicked out and um, that's about it I'm going to kick myself out of the podcast in a minute, Lionel, because I've got to go up down the road because someone's got to someone's got to sort our reservation for dinner. Indeed. Well, I mean, we'll we'll let you go then, Daniel, you, because we're staying in the same place this evening. It looks like a very nice place. Yeah. Uh, has a restaurant, so we need you to go ahead and make I know, sure. It's vitally important. I'm sure the <laughs> listeners will agree. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's good to it's good to be back, and I'll see you again tomorrow, Daniel. Thank you. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. If you would like to get 20% off Science in Sport's products, you can go to scienceinsport.com and when you check out, put in the code CPORG20. That's CP for Cycling Podcast, ORG, A-U-G for August 20. Uh, I know it's September, but the code hasn't been changed yet. So uh, if you're buying anything from Science in Sport, use that 20% discount code while you still can. I think it will change at some point soon. Now, Fran, Chris Froome was playing mind games a little bit on the rest day, suggesting that his rivals should take it easy in the time trial, just in case they were to suffer in uh, tomorrow's stage with the steep uphill finish. But Alberto Contador made some interesting comments also about the, the financial health of cycling. And uh, he's right riding for Trek, a team sponsored by a bicycle manufacturer. Back in the glory days, Contador would have been one of the best paid riders in the peloton. Mm. Chris Froome, I would have thought, is one of the best paid riders now. Certainly working for the team that has the biggest budget. But what would the kind of the basis of Contador's comments on the rest day? Well, I guess basically this sorry captain has been around for a while. You know, Jonathan Waters has been a strong advocate for this. He then did his MVI final piece of work on this very topic. And uh, I guess the strength of Sky is right now too much for the rest of the peloton. And since they are growing increasingly frustrated by the fact that most teams can't afford to buy a roster strong enough to compete head on with Team Sky. That's the reason why there are more voices calling for the salary cap. Jonathan Waters, actually, he's an advocate of a budget cap, which is slightly different. Yeah. doesn't mean that you can't pay your riders you know, as much as you want, but the, the team's overall budget would be capped, which, of course, would change the makeup of a team's roster. And arguably, it would stop Sky from being able to bring in so many top-class riders, paying them better as super domestiques, if you want to call them that, than they would perhaps get at other teams and enabling themselves to build a roster where they have a rider like Wout Poles here as their kind of second man working for Chris Froome, I'm sure on a very good salary that, that may exceed what he would get as a team leader elsewhere. Yeah, but, but you know, it's not all about talent recruitment. You know, of course, you can buy a Galactico team and expect it to be the best of the world. But if you don't get to motivate the riders to train them properly, to prepare them for the goals of the season and keep them together when they are working towards them, you are not going to succeed anyway. So I guess in the Spanish TV, they are obsessed with this thing of Sky being the biggest budget team, you know, and they are using it, throwing this argument away every time they see the Sky riders pulling from the peloton as a way to justify how dominant they are. But I think there is way more to it than the fact that they pay big salary and have the biggest talent pool in the world tour. 
I mean, certainly at the, the motor racing circuit today, they had their big race hub set up, two-story building. It's the first time I've actually seen it. I've seen photographs, of course. But I had a look, a look inside. I didn't go inside, but I, I know Richard went in to interview a couple of people last week. I mean, it looks... Because we were there at a motor racing circuit, it looks like something from Formula One or MotoGP, and that's obviously where the idea has come from. Um, but then when you look at the team buses next door, um, you know, they, they look quite small by comparison. And uh, I was on the Dimension Data bus today, and it's a nice bus, nothing particularly wrong with it, but it's not kitted out in quite the same luxury way as, as the Orica bus or the Sky bus or one or two other buses. There's a, there's a real hierarchy of how the riders are supported away from the race, just in those, you know, the, the surroundings that they're in, I guess. You know, the, about the Sky Hub that was being set up today for the riders to warm up in front of the public, they, they were standing on a stage, like, two meters above the people so they all can see them and I could hear some Spanish fans making jokes about throwing them peanuts <laughs> as, as they were warming up <laughs> so yeah that, that kind of worked but not that much you know it was impressive but definitely no all sparring so the Spanish were almost like zoo animals they're exactly. there to be looked at <laughs> uh, a bit, bit like, uh, yeah, going, going to look at the animals in the zoo. Yeah. Well, Fran, you spoke to Lucha Guechelena of Trek. Yes. Um, let's hear from him on the subject of salary caps. Yeah, let's hear from him. Quite very interesting comments about the revenue streams. Well, it's a difficult discussion. I mean, in the business model of uh, professional sports, there's always a, a salary cap. If you analyze what's going on, in the, especially in the American sports that are always considered the, the benchmark for the pro sport, you need a salary cap simply to keep the um, competitivity between teams. But it's working when the system is all set up for that. So there's a draft, there's a system to allow the weakest team to hire the best talent and not just focusing that on the um, high payroll. Uh, so I think that the salary cap can work in cycling when the business model is that and where their share revenue for all the stakeholders. By the way, I think that in actual cycling it will be difficult to apply, even if it could be a good point to discuss. Because uh, it's clear that if the budget are start to assuming a figure that is too different between the low budget team and the higher budget team, then uh, clearly the competition is getting too too much managed by by money and that can create after a while a boring system but we all know that in professional sport the economy is what making the the, the difference and the financial wise are making the difference so i think that is a good way to to chase but always uh, keeping in mind that is the business model that can change not just put it in a salary cap on the actual business model. We, we always speak about revenue sharing, thinking of the TV rights that organizers do sell and basically own. Um, but do you think that this should also mm, happen with the commercial structure in terms of sponsorship shares and so on? I, I guess that a business model is pretty simple, as in the other professional sport. Organizers, teams are making the, the business So that's are the two stakeholders that for the most need to discuss and create events that are allowing both to gain money and make things better. And on this kind of system, then you can create a salary cap that allows to keep control and keep the competition active on the way to have a balance uh, between competitors. And I think that's, uh, that's the only solution If you want to put a salary cap, that's the business model. If this actual business model stays, then we need to, to see what the team together can do to try to find revenue and to avoid that the team are folding year by year. Well, Fran, Alberto Contador, one of the star names of Spanish cycling, but not riding for a Spanish team. How would you sum up the strength of um, the Spanish peloton at the moment in terms of the teams? Because we were talking about sort of 20 years ago or 18 years ago when the, the Angleroo first appeared in the, the Vuelta. And back in those days, 
you know, Banesto on say, I think was still just about around um, and had been around for a long while as a, as a, a real super team. In fact, they were one of the first teams, if not the first team, to have a big bus that the riders yeah. could go in. Everyone else just had team cars and then a few got camper vans, but Onsei were the first with a, a big bus. So they kind of led the way in many senses. Movistar, of course, have got huge backing from a telecommunications company that has interests all around the world, but there isn't the second, third, fourth big Spanish team but it's not as strong as it, it used to be what's the attitude in Spain at the moment well to be honest the mood right now is quite a bit okay for since 2013 since the demise of Euskal Tele Euskadi the mood was pessimistic because we the Spanish Peloton went down for, to four teams one World Tour Movistar one Pro Conti Caja Rural and two continental teams uh, Euskadi and uh, Burgos BH And we could hardly see any new project on the horizon. Luckily, this uh, summer, there have been some positive news. The Polar Tech Comera team, continental team set up by Alberto Contador, uh, strong rumors of Burgos BH, the current continental team, stepping up to Pro Continental, which are great news that will probably be confirmed by the protagonist uh, tomorrow at the start village of Villa Diego and then we have Landa of course Mikel Landa he introduced yesterday his new project of taking over the Fundación Euskadi which is the structure that originally ran the Euskal Tel Euskadi team and was now surviving as an under 23 team they were struggling for budget and Mikel Landa stepped in to save it Well, you spoke to Mikel Landa, of course, currently with Sky, moving to Movistar next season. And let's hear what he said about his plans to develop this uh, Basque development team. Uh, I born in the Fundación Euskadi. They give me all I need during my, my career to arrive where I am now. And uh, they were in a bad situation and, and I decided to, to help them because I want the best no, for the, for the young, young riders. I want to give them all I have. So that's why, why I did. What's your project for, for this Fundación Euskadi? At the moment, uh, we don't have a, an idea because we, we work a lot to, to save the Fundación Euskadi. And yeah, in the coming days, we are, we are going to start uh, starting working in, in, in the coming years. No? Maybe continental, maybe um, under amateur. So we will see. Okay, so when are we going to find out the answer to that big question whether the Fundación Euskadi slash Miguel Landa will have a continental team next year Wait, uh, when I, I don't know maybe in two weeks maybe in three no we, we, we start working no and we, we need an answer no in, in two three weeks because uh, we are in September and the riders they need to, to know no the future But who or what companies supports you in this project At the moment, uh, Fundación Euskadi have um, partners. That's a very important part in, in this foundation. But also, we started speaking with Orbea. They always had been with uh, Fundación Euskadi. And I think they can be a very important part in this project. What about Echeondo? Because I see people from Echeondo here too. Yeah, they can be also. No, I, We speak with them. Mm -hmm. They are also interested, no? because this is a vast project. So maybe... They help us also. We've seen projects from other riders and so on, and some of them do invest their personal money in their projects for young riders. Do you uh, in understand or do you intend to invest your own money on this? At this moment, I'm not going to do. We want to, to, to have new sponsors and maybe also all the sponsors not to support us. But of course, if we need uh, more money that, that we have, I will, I will put it. Mikel told me that this was actually the first time since the Tour de France that he had spoken English. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. His English is very good. Yeah, yeah, But, yes, indeed. Well, we'll see how that developed. Of course, Euskatel Euskadi was a Basque team in, in its entirety, wasn't it? Um, you had to be Basque to ride for them. Uh, I think they had a French rider, but he was a French Basque. I can't remember yeah. who that was. That Pierre Cassot. 
and Romain Sicard. That's right, Romain Sicard, of course. So, I mean, there's such a such a tradition of uh, cycling in the Basque country, isn't there? And uh, we're not quite going into it, are we, in the next few days? Or are we? I'm, my... No, no, we are not. Unfortunately, we are not. We're bypassing this year, aren't we? We're going across Burgos and then into Asturias for yeah. um, the, the, the final stage before yeah. Madrid. It's a shame because we are so close to Vitoria, to Alava, and we could have seen all those beautiful trees with wine bottles hanging from the from the branches but, but oh. Asturias is uh, dramatic in its own way isn't it and I'm certainly looking mm. forward to uh, visiting the Angleru on Saturday well can I make a couple of final points on this Basque cycling scene there are currently with Mikel Pratlanda stepping in to try and set up a continental team for the Fundación Euskadi. At least, at the very least, he's saving it and he's speaking of a serious project to actually set up a continental team the very next year. There are two fully Basque projects overlapping at this moment. The Fundación Euskadi of Michelanda and the Euskadi Muria team uh, run by Jono Diozola, former Vanesto, Kelme and some Italian team rider that has been running a continental team for three years and next year we'll have a pro-continental one. Both teams ride Orbia, but I understand that Orbia is way more interested in supporting Landa's team than Odrio Zolas. Orbea, of course, is the Basque bicycle manufacturing company, a very famous name in uh, bicycle manufacturing and synonymous with the Basque, Basque country, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And uh, you want uh, news I just received? I just want, I just we just going to throw them at you, Go on. you know, and see how you react to them. What Canon del Drive Dray Pack rider has announced his retirement? Who is that? Andrew Tolansky. Really? Yeah, that's what I what they are telling me in WhatsApp. If if that's not true, we are going to edit this out. But if it's true, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Is that how it's working now? Yeah, right. exactly. Oh, well, that's, if we, if that's, we this is the, journalism now. If we all you know? have the option to edit out our mistakes, I mean, yeah. it makes it a whole different <laughs> podcast. Well, that's a very interesting one. Has that mm-hmm. just happened in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes? Yes, it has. Very interesting. Well, we'll we'll try and follow up on that tomorrow. Of course, the whole team is uh, is struggling at the moment. They're trying to raise this funding to plug the gap left by a sponsor that uh, has pulled out. Their whole team is in doubt for next year, but we'll follow that. What if I told you that rumors in the grapevine say that the team has found the funding? Well, Jonathan Waters has been saying for a few days, uh, watch this space, he's very close to um, getting something, but I think until they announce it... Exactly. Well, there we are. Exactly. We are not doing a speculation, only facts. I don't know. Well, as you know, yeah, I hate speculation. Well, we'll follow <laughs> up on all of that tomorrow. Um, we better wrap it up there, Fran, because we've got to drive quite a long way this evening to get yeah. there's quite a transfer this evening before tomorrow's stage 17. So yeah. we shall hit the road and... If you uh, want to listen to something on Wednesday morning or indeed Wednesday afternoon, the next episode of Kilometre Zero will be released for Friends of the Podcast. And it's about the Dimension Data team who are down to three riders. Um, They've been wiped out really by a virus that uh, first hit Ben King right at the start of the race. And one by one, their riders are pulled out. There's only three of them left. Uh, I spoke to one of them, Lachlan Morton. I spoke to a couple of their sports directors as well about how morale is. They seem, the three that are left, Igor Anton and uh, Jacques Janser van Rensburg, seem in reasonable spirits. Morton seemed in reasonable spirits. But I wanted to know what it's like when you lose two-thirds of your roster and you've Mm. still got the best part of a week to go until Madrid. So that will be tomorrow's Kilometre Zero. Um, Other than that, Fran, we will be back, hopefully, with Daniel again tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lionel. Looking forward to hear your kilometer zero.